Hey, welcome again. And I know that many of us are struggling with the disappointments of not being able to meet in person. Uh, many of you would have received an email from us and some other phone call notifications to let you know that uh, the leadership here at Central made the decision that we would stay online, uh, particularly for our morning service to the end of February. Now, that being said, all things could change. The government might change regulations and policies. And even when they make those changes, if they do, we'll still be making decisions around what do we believe is best for us as a congregation? Because the decision wasn't really made because of uh, protocols and those kinds of things. They were made more from the framework of being able to provide meaningful ministry to our people. And so because of COVID hesitancy, because of significant health issues within our congregation, many of them unable to attend as they keep themselves safe, we just decided that we would cancel. And so we keep looking at it, we keep evaluating, and we'll keep you informed as to what we decide in the coming days. But for now, we're going to be in this format. And so we pray that God will be using it as a meaningful way for you to connect with uh, the ministries here, for us to connect with you at home or wherever it is that you're watching. I think some people watch and listen to this uh, podcast or these uh, YouTube videos uh, even while they're driving. Uh, just don't be looking down at the screen. So we just want to pray and invite God into our time together. Father, may your Holy Spirit do a powerful work in each of our lives. May we have a sense that you are sovereign, that you are aware, that you are present, that you are at work, and you will be doing things in and through your people to create an environment where people might have a longing and a hungering for Jesus. So Lord, we pray for the message today. May the thoughts be thoughts that have flowed through your Holy Spirit's filter, through my mouth, out to the people who will uh, provide the commitment to be able to share this time together. So Lord, bless them, bless our time with your presence, with your um, insight, and with your purposes to be accomplished in our lives, so that you would be glorified in all things, in Jesus' name, amen. So we began this series as the dark days came back upon us of discovering God's life lessons in the dark days of his people. And so that's the theme and will be the theme, really, whether we're in person or we're online. Because we know that people are dealing with dark days. And we want to address how to find hope when we are faced with dark times. And so a couple of weeks ago, we introduced this series uh, by taking a look at the darkness that covered the world. And we had the concept of realizing that light still shone. God created light and we were able to engage in seeing his whole creation come to life. And the Lord will be with you um, and your everlasting light from Isaiah 6. And then last week, we took a jump a little bit further into Genesis, uh, sort of into chapter 2 and, and sort of looking at a number of things there. Uh, when we face dark times and the whole issue was, you're out of here, right? So uh, Adam and Eve and all of us then fall into a circumstance and a place where um, our lives are impacted because of those decisions. And so we did take a look at Genesis chapter 2 and how God in the beginning had created everything. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden. And he has this idyllic life. And he has this experience of intimacy with God and fellowship with God and walking with God. This powerful image of an, of an uncertain time frame when God is with Adam and with Eve. But then there's this troublesome conversation between the devil and Eve. And the result of that is what we call the walk of shame and the issues that are around uh, shame and how that uh, isolates us from relationship and especially from God. And so we, at the end of all of that, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. You're out of here. And we realized that there were four important things that were going on then, that they had the chance to do right, but they made a choice to do wrong. And realizing after the fact that there is always a cost of our choices and this truth that somebody always pays. You see, your dark days may be of your own making, 
or your dark days may be of someone else's making, and even further, your choices may be the cause of another's dark days. And even though the, uh, the, the, the unfolding of God's plan to, starts to take place, Isaiah will remind us that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And as we go through the scriptures and we find these dark moments, and you've been sharing with me some of those favorite Bible verses that talk about dark times, we'll touch on a lot of them. But we realize that uh, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who will receive it. And they will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. And even though in those bleak, dark days of the beginning of man, we find God with a promise and God with a purpose, that even though there was death in one man, there is life in the man Jesus. And that brings us to today. When we face dark times, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 25. So I encourage you to read back over it, uh, get some ideas, maybe that'll unfold from a result of our time together. But we're going to start and, and start to realize, I think, the, the, the whole process that was involved with Adam and Eve in particular is the process that, that plagues mankind and still is the process that we struggle with today. So let's begin in Genesis chapter 4. Adam, or the translation would also be the man, made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. I don't want to miss that. I don't want us to miss that. She has a sense that even though they have been cast out, the Lord was her helper. And later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel, we get some of the background, because now the boys are grown up. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. So one of the things that we miss, and we're going to try and address that today, is the time frame that things happen. So how long would it have been from when the seeds were planted and, and the, the plants were grown and the harvest would come? Or when the flocks could bring forth their young to be a firstborn sacrifice? So here's what happens. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. It was like, Abel, you did a good job. Abel, I, I'm happy with what you did. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Somehow that got expressed to the two boys. Yep, happy with that. Huh, I think you're missing the point. So Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. You know, oftentimes rejection isn't necessarily seen as an invitation to be different. It evokes anger in us. And we, we become resentful. And so God basically arrives and I think he goes, hey, we need to have a chat. And lots of times in our circumstance, we need somebody to come by and go, you know what? We need to have a chat. Because I think you missed the mark on that one. But I think there's a chance that you could do better. So this is the conversation they have. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now, catch this. I didn't catch it till today when I was doing the final prep. God hasn't abandoned them. He's kicked them out of the garden, but he's still in conversation with them. And it was like, oh my goodness. God was speaking to them in conversation with them. They weren't alone. There was something going on that allowed God, even in that brokenness, to be engaged with them, and to have concern about Cain. And he says this to him, If you do what is right, there's a chance. If you do what is right, will it not be accepted? 
So yeah, you made a mistake. But you know, if, if you do the right thing, won't that be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. It's like, Cain, there's some choices here that you need to make. You know, it's, it's just like your mom and dad. They had a choice. And, and Cain, you've still got the choice to do the right thing. See, everything in life teaches you a lesson. We just have to be willing to learn the lesson. But far too many of us are very unteachable. So the story unfolds for us. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, let's go out to the field. Come on, let's go for a walk. Let's go check things out. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now many of us know this story, but I want you to try and envision the terror that Abel has when he sees the murderous look on his brother. When he sees him coming after him with who knows what, a club, a stone, uh, some, some skins tied into some type of rope. Uh, it's just hard to envision that a brother would rise up against a brother out of envy and jealousy because he had favor, but that favor was also extended to Cain, and he really abandons and rejects it, and he becomes the first murderer. So if God had those first two kids and they disobeyed, the next first parents, they've got a kid who becomes a murderer and they lose a child. Then the Lord said, so he had the, cho the chance to do right, but he made the choice to do wrong. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? It's an interesting conversation because Cain's talking to God. Do you see what's going on? God hasn't abandoned them. He's still willing to have a conversation. And, 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 and Cain goes, yeah, whatever. Like, I'm not the brother's keeper. It's like somebody else's problem. I don't know where he is. Maybe check with mom and dad. Maybe they know. I thought about how do they discover that their son is dead. And there's not a whole lot of other people around to blame for it. And to know that your son murdered your other youngest son, and he's there with you. So God has some conversation with Cain. The Lord said, what you have done, or what have you done, listen. Your blood, brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. It's an amazing image how the creation is engaged in that brokenness and absorbs, as it were, the blood or the pain. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. So here's what we know, the chance to do right, the choice to do wrong, and the cost of our choices. Cain says to him, today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. Hang on to that phrase. I will be hidden from your presence. Because he knows things have gone really bad in this relationship that he had with the creator. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain. and We have no idea what that is. All kinds of people have speculated. Put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence. 
from the Lord's presence he went out and lived in the land of Nod east of Eden. So here's that truth for us. The chance to do right, the choice to do wrong, the cost of choices, and somebody always pays. Those are blood hands that were engaged in that conversation. And Cain is forced to leave and wander. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. There's lots of questions, and we don't have time to work through some of those. Cain was then building a city. It's interesting, the wanderer wanted to build a city because he wanted to settle down. And he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Ired, and Ired was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael was the father of Methuselah, and Methuselah, uh, Methushael, not Methuselah, Methushael was the father of Lamech. So here's what's gone on. Cain has an Enoch. Enoch has Ired. Mahujael has, um, uh, you got the list, right? Methushael, and then Lamech is born. And so if each of those guys were 20 years of age, we're talking about 100 years of time unfolds in just that one verse, listing off the names. And if you do some reading on in chapter 5 and chapter 6, you'll find that people were living a long time, and we'll touch on some of that. But here's what happens. Time is just marching on. Time is just moving forward, and then here's something that happens. We're almost 100 years out, right? Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. It's the lineage of people is what we're getting now. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. So he's the musician, the musician type. Zillah, the other wife, also had a son, Tubal Cain who forged all kinds of things of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal's Cain's sister was Nema. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. And here's an interesting thing. I have killed a man. It's an interesting thing when your husband comes home and he goes, sits the two girls down and he goes, I killed a man. Because I wonder in their minds if they knew that their husband had this kind of rage possibility. Maybe he had already shown rage at home. Who knows? And this is why he killed the man, for wounding me. So there must have been some kind of a struggle, or maybe it was an incidental thing. But whatever, Lamech decides he's taking that man out. Vengeance. Revenge. Remember a while ago we talked an eye for an eye? Tooth for a tooth? That was justice instead of revenge, because revenge always wants more. You hurt me, I'm taking your life. And then he has this phrase, if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech 77 times. He knows he's done a horrific thing. It's almost like things have gone from bad to worse. And so as we finish up that narrative of bad to worse, the chapter comes to an interesting end. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. They knew who had taken that son's life. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. So I'm going to jump um, into chapter 5, because chapter 5, unlike we've just read Cain's descendants, we're now going to see... Uh, Adam's descendants through Seth. And so a couple of quick things. It's in chapter 5. This is the written account of Adam's family line. Descendants, the descent of man. When God created mankind, he made them in his likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind, or Adam, when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years... He had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. 
The third born kid is born when Adam is 130. So the interesting thing, after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. He lives to be 930. Now, I don't know whether they were measuring years like our years or a shorter year, but even if it was a shorter year, half a year, that's a lot of living. And in those early days of creation, because sin stain has not brought about um, quick death like it has today, they just lived a lot longer. They lived a healthier life. But at the end of chapter 4, here's a fascinating phrase. Lamech has killed the young man that had wounded him. Eve, or, uh, Eve has given birth to another son. And this phrase, at that time, people began to call on the Lord. Like, it's sort of like, whoa! A hundred years and now, after generations have been raised and the population has expanded and cities are being built and, and people are marrying and giving in marriage, but there's no sense of God. After this murderous act, the, 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 the Moses, I believe, who wrote the, the, the first five books, he, he, he pops, pops this in. From then, people began to call on the name of the Lord. It reminded me of Romans 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, what happens in generations and cultures and everything else, if there is an abandonment of the things of God and the principles and the truths and the relationships, darkness comes. But the joyous thing is that when they call on the name of the Lord, he will answer. And when we do, he will save his people. And so we have this sense that, hey, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good, until you turn the page. And in the next weeks, we're going to keep turning the pages of Scripture and find out some interesting things. Next week, we're going to take a look at Noah, and this is what's said about Noah's days. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Hundreds of years will flow by before you get to Noah, before we'll get to Noah, except only a week. But where is the end of all of that? It's horrific. Everyone did what was evil in their own eyes. And that reminded me of Judges 21. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Does it remind you of anything? And I, I jumped from that and I went all the way to the New Testament in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. And this is the descriptor of the world in Jesus' day. Throughout the world, it's the descriptor. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. God assumes the responsibility for revealing himself to his people. But his people turn their back. For since, Paul continues, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. In the wickedness of all of humanity as it unfolds and descends into decay, Paul is telling us there's judgment that comes with that. There's a cost to the choices that we make because somebody always pays. Um, so the people are without excuse. Therefore, and here's what happens. Therefore, God gave them over. Like Adam and Eve, he gave them over to live outside the garden. Like Cain, he gave him over to do what he chose. Cain had a choice. Lamech, he had a choice. But somehow, when man is left to his own devices, it's not good. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised.
Amen. Think about today. Think about our cultures. And this phrase in verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. It's like, if that's where you want to go, if that's what your behavior you want it to be, have at it. Just know there will be a price and somebody will have the cost to be paid. In verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. So a depraved worship, a depraved lifestyle, and a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Although they know God's righteous decrees and that those who do such things deserve to de deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. Those were dark days back then. Dark days from God's perspective. Your reading assignment for this week, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. Because the nations of the New Testament were in horrifically dark days. You can do all kinds of research on the lifestyles of the Greeks and the Romans, the barbarism, the immorality. And then the gospel comes. And for all of them and for us, where is your hope? Paul says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. No exceptions. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Adam, Jesus. Death, life. It's a fantastic narrative about God's compassionate kindness. Paul said before he had written all those things about the, the, the decline of man and his depravity, he said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as, as it is written. The just shall live by faith. And they turn their hearts to the Lord because, Psalm 36, verse 5, God is faithful. The just shall live by faith in the one who is faithful. In Lament Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 23, great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. You see, he is the God of comfort, the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11 articulate that for us. That even in our darkness, even in our depravity, God made a way for us to find hope because our comfort and our confidence is in God. You know, there's a ton of things going on that could be all kinds of cause for me to worry and for you to worry. But worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. So I don't know what you do with your worry in the midst of all the things that are happening maybe in your life, things that are out of your control, things that are beyond your understanding. I don't know where you find your comfort and hope, but I find it in the man in the Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd ask people to suggest to me some of their favorite dark day stories, and one of our folks wrote this. For me, one of them is Job's story, especially when he talks to his wife and says, should I accept only good from God and not the difficult times? I can remember a time when I was in total darkness and all I could do was pray and cry out, begging for the mercy that Jesus promised me. Life everlasting if I believed in him. Yet I was in darkness for a long time. I don't know how long you've been in your darkness. Maybe you're about to step into some unknown, a health issue, a relationship issue, a future issue. But darkness is that which seems to crowd us and crowd and, and, and darken everything about our lives. But like this person shared, then 
the light shone. How glorious is that? I am very relieved that this time in my life is coming to an end and I can start my new life with total peace and so much joy. The narrative of mankind is filled with depravity and glimmers of hope when God would engage again with his people. And the unique thing for the Christian is God engages with us every day. He is constantly available. He is ready for conversation. He's ready to help us make some corrections and go, are you sure that's the idea? I think if you do that, there might be, uh, you know what I mean? This is why this is our prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian hope isn't found in my own pull myself up, do whatever I can. There's some things that I might be needing to do, but my hope is found in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that's the same place that you will go for your hope. Let me pray with you. Father, may you be glorified. May we understand the tendencies of man and the tendencies of each of us, that we might start to live a victorious life like the life that Jesus promised for all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. May you be glorified. May you minister to the lives of our people in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.